Welcome to the audio commentary track for Gamera vs. Guiron from 1969. If we're going to be spending the next 80 minutes together, I figure it's only polite if I introduce myself first. My name is David Callet. I'm a film historian, and one of my favorite genres is Japanese fantasy, horror, and science fiction. You might know me from such books as A Critical History and Filmography of Toho's Godzilla series from McFarland Press, or J-Horror, The Definitive Guide to the Ring, the Grudge, and Beyond from Vertical Press. I've also provided liner notes and audio commentaries on many great Japanese monster and horror films on DVD and Blu-ray. But, you know, none of that matters. Those aren't really my qualifications. So let's talk about what does matter. You see, a long time ago, when I was just six years old, I was at a drive-in theater in Raleigh, North Carolina with my family for a double feature of Godzilla movies that turned out to be a transformative, life-defining moment. And I've been a dedicated fan of Japanese monsters ever since. And as we shall see, the fullest appreciation of the joys that this movie has to offer comes from that childlike sense of wonder. If you are not yourself six years old or in the company of one or more six-year-olds, then you do yourself a favor to reach deep into yourself, to find that inner six-year-old and let him or her out for the next hour and a quarter. This is a very childish movie. I mean that with all love and respect. It's not meant as a jab, but let's not kid ourselves. This ain't Rashomon, nor should it be. There's a worrisome trend among fans of Japanese monster movies, especially among older fans who may be insecure about their love of movies that appeal to younger audiences, that seeks to play down the childish aspects in favor of grim and dark foreboding. But in the drive-in all those years ago, what I fell in love with was guys in rubber suits pummeling each other. I was in for a penny, in for a pound, and I don't need to pretend these are anything other than what they are. And what are they? Well, to be precise, this is the fifth entry in a movie franchise about a giant fire-breathing monster turtle who is the friend to all children. Eight movies were made in this series between 1965 and 1980, every one of which was directed at least in part by Noriaka Yuasa. More on him to come. Every one was written by screenwriter Nissan Takahashi, and they were produced by the movie studio Dai Ai. Dai Ai is Japanese for big picture or big movie, so these are big movie productions. Now, the white lab-coated scientist here, Dr. Shiga, is played by Aiji Funakoshi. And if you've seen the original Gamera movie from 1965, you saw him as Dr. Hidaka. If you were around in Japan in the 1950s, you'd have seen him all over the place as one of Dai Ai Studio's top leading men. As he got older, he transitioned to more character-based supporting roles, and as such, he ended up appearing in a wide variety of different genres. For example, he played the title character in Blind Beast, a bizarre horror film made the same year as Guiron, about a blind sculptor who kidnaps and sexually terrorizes a young woman. Funakoshi basically walked off the set of that psychodrama, put on a lab coat, and started talking about mysterious waves from outer space. That was life for a Dai actor. To be fair, I should also mention what is arguably his finest work, Fires on the Plain, a 1959 war drama by director Kan Ichikawa. Here's Funakoshi in his own words. Quote, We were like a family. Our personal relationships were very strong, which is why you would have this sense of obligation to do pictures when asked. Interesting, the way he referred to doing films like this as an obligation. I'm indebted to my friend, the esteemed Stuart Galbraith IV, whose extraordinary book of interviews, Monsters Are Attacking Tokyo, provided that quote and several others that I'll share later. I should take a moment to call out some of the other researchers and historians whose work I've relied on. David Milner's interview with Noriyaki Yuasa was an essential starting point, as was Bill Ferguson's work restoring these films with additional context on VHS in the early 2000s. Also, the book Age of the Gods by the late Guy Mariner Tucker. J.D. Lees' G-Fan magazine and G-Fest conventions provided numerous interviews with people like Yuasa and others. And, of course, the larger community of Japanese monster movie scholars, including August Ragone, Ed Gudsashevsky, Steve Rifle, and others whose names I may be omitting only because I'm an idiot, not any reflection on them. 
Now, of course, one of the reasons this is a childish movie is, you know, the lead characters are children. And in terms of evaluating the quality of these children's performances, though, a few words first on the challenge of child actors. Acting isn't easy. The world is full of people who want to be actors, but very few of them ever get to a point where they're recognized by others as being any good at it. Now, if you want to get a good child actor, you're looking for that slim part of the Venn diagram of people who want to be actors and are also good at it and are also children. Add to that the complication that children are, by definition, immature, which is another way of saying that they are unreliable, unpredictable, and hard to work with. If you are lucky enough to have found a good child actor and you have a decent working relationship with that very special and rare person, then time is going to come along and steal that from you. Take, for example, Akira Takarada. He appeared in the very first Godzilla movie back in 1956. He continued to appear in them throughout the 1960s, the 1990s, the 2000s. He was in the 2014 Godzilla movie. The guy is still making movies as I record this 66 years after his debut. That is an actor. Meanwhile, there's Haley Joel Osment whose performance as a child actor in The Sixth Sense earned him an Oscar nomination. That's as much as you can expect from a child actor. And he's still working too, but he's not a child actor anymore. He stopped being a child actor a long time ago. So, returning to Gamera versus Guiron. This wasn't the first time they'd had child actors. Starting with the previous entry in the franchise, Gamera vs. Virus, the situation had become even more complicated. The U.S. distributor, American International Pictures, had decreed that going forward they needed a white co-star along with the Japanese. It was a bluntly racist ask, but they were doing what they thought they needed to in order to get these movies the widest possible audience in the U.S., so the racism wasn't coming from American International Pictures so much as it was coming from America itself. The audience was racist, so putting a white kid in the mix helped them feel less put out, I guess. Anyway, all this did was take the already gargantuan task of finding a decent child actor and add the need to find a decent American child actor in Japan. So the producers just gave up on the actor part and simply focused on finding a child. As it happened, Dai Ai was located near a U.S. military base, and the base had a school for the children of the soldiers stationed there. Assistant producer Kiyoshi Kawamura asked the school's principal if it would be okay to do a casting call. The school agreed. Of all the children they interviewed, Christopher Murphy stood out, in no small part because he was the most fluent in Japanese, which made him easier to work with, even if he wasn't actually all that keen on the gig. As time passed and the production start date neared, Christopher still hadn't formally agreed. He seemed to be dragging his feet for some reason. The production team was starting to sweat. Did they have to go back and recast? Did they have to reschedule? Turns out, Christopher was worried because he'd had to promise his father his grades wouldn't suffer, and he wasn't entirely sure he could keep up that end of the bargain. Director Noriaki Yuasa directed the kids by not focusing on the dialogue, letting them play-act it out around the scenario, and this helped them feel less self-conscious about their performances. Contrast that with Kon Omura. He was a consummate professional, an established and recognized comic actor known for broad slapstick and accustomed to playing slight variations on the same basic character each time. Screenwriters would just write in a Kon Chan character and you'd get Kon Chan to come play him. You knew what you were going to get. It wasn't subtle, but think of him as the Japanese Don Knotts. You don't hire Don Knotts for subtle, you hire him to come be Don Knotts. The child actors were drawn to Kanomura. He was very popular with kids. In fact, Kanchan's fans came to rubberneck at the shoot, and Dai Ai staff had a hard time keeping them out of the shot. To represent Gamera on set, an assistant director held up a flag to establish the sight line. Turns out this was a bit of a problem for Kanchan because his own children were excited their papa was working on a Gamera movie, and they'd ask him each night, How is Gamera? Kanchan didn't have the heart to tell them Gamera was just a guy holding up a flag, and he'd say, uh, Gamera's fine. We filmed a scene together today. His kids kept badgering to be allowed to come with their dad to work so they could meet Gamera, and he had to fob them off with excuses. Uh, Gamera is really busy. 
One of these kids that he lied to about how busy Gamera was grew up to be an actor himself, and in 1997 appeared with Jodie Foster in the movie Contact. I've mentioned our director, Noriyaki Yuasa, several times already, but I haven't told you anything meaningful about him. Time to fix that, since grappling with the childishness of this movie means grappling with the childishness of the man who made it. I'll set the stage by telling you this. Yuasa came from a showbiz family. His father was a well-established actor. His extended family were actors. It was taken for granted that he would follow in those footsteps, and indeed, he did start out as a child actor for a while, an experience that perhaps served him well in understanding how best to relate to the child actors in his movies. But as he got older and was able to make decisions for himself, Yuasa decided acting was not his thing. What's striking, though, is how he explained this decision. The way Yuasa tells the story, he observed that his father was a philanderer, and all the other actors he knew also slept around. And all that faithlessness was objectionable to him. He realized actors were just bad, immoral people, and he wanted no part of it. I have to say, that's a very childlike way of viewing the world. I mean, I'm not saying that Yuasa was wrong to value monogamy and fidelity, or to want to ally himself with people who shared his values, but it's a very childlike approach to having hard, black and white, absolutist morals, and to take a small sample set and conclude dogmatically that it represents the whole. We'll be seeing this kind of thinking from him again. Speaking of Noriaki's childlike outlook, it's important to get a few facts and evidence about his background. He was born in 1933. From our perspective today, just saying it like that, he was born in 1933, doesn't really land properly, so let's try that again. When Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in December 1941 and formally entered World War II, Noriaki had just recently celebrated his eighth birthday. When American bombers dropped atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945, ending that war, Noriaki had yet to turn 12. Meanwhile, over at Toho, the primary creative forces responsible for Godzilla were men who had either seen military service in World War II firsthand or who served the Imperial Army in other ways, making wartime propaganda. They experienced the trauma of that war as adults. They saw their friends die in battle, civilians burned and blown to bits, cities laid to waste. They witnessed the horrific reality of it and came away saying, no more, no more of this. And when they sat down to make monster movies, when they sat down to make any kind of movies for that matter, those defining experiences inevitably came through. It touched everything they did. It was part of who they were. So there's an undercurrent of raw, politically charged, real-world anxiety that runs through Godzilla movies, even when they are at their silliest. But that's not true for Gamera. Noriaki Yuasa was too young. He didn't directly experience the war. Nor did screenwriter Nissan Takahashi, who was a little bit older, but not by much. The defining cultural experience of the 1940s largely passed them by. Well, I mean, except for how the civilians at home experience war, which is to say, secondhand. Noriaki watched the grown-ups around him, and with the same jaundiced, judgy eye that he cast on his father's mistresses. Specifically, Noriaki listened to the adults around him go from spouting jingoistic platitudes one minute to suddenly switching on a dime and turning into anti-war purists the next. Now, you could go to the likes of Shinichi Sekizawa, the Godzilla screenwriter who came home from being a prisoner of war with a newfound conviction that war was a joke, and he'd tell you it's a sign of adulthood to learn from your mistakes and grow as a person. But Noriaki just saw hypocrisy, all these adults, spineless wretches, jumping whatever bandwagon happens to be passing. No real opinions of their own, just whatever ideas are trending at the moment, and always, always finding ways to deflect blame off themselves. It engendered a lifelong skepticism of adults in Noriaki. Quote, I hoped that when I grew up, I would, in my way, still be like a child. I think this sentiment can be seen in my movies. Well... Yes, sir, it can. 
By the way, are you enjoying that catchy Gamera theme song? It's a real earworm, isn't it? It was composed by Kenjiro Hirose, with lyrics by Nissan Takahashi, and debuted at the end of Gamera vs. Gaios in 1967, and became a mainstay of the series ever since. But Hirose is not the composer of this film. His Gamera theme is getting recycled here, but the original music was composed by Shunsuke Kikuchi, who formed a tight bond with director Yuasa. This was their first collaboration, but they worked together on the next three Gamera films, and he became a lifelong collaborator of Yuasa's. Kikuchi remains one of Japan's most in-demand media composers, crafting music for TV dramas, children's shows, anime, and a wide array of productions for TV and film. But as I said, this isn't Kikuchi's music right now, this is Hirose's, and I think I just want to enjoy the song for a bit. Consider this a dance break. Let's get up and dance to the Gamera March, and I'll be back when it's over. Okay, so when we last left him, Noriyaki Yuasa had decided he didn't want to be an actor. What did he want to be? Well, through his father and other family connections, he had an easy entree into the world of filmmaking, and he applied to Dai Ai to become a director. That is to say, he would be hired as an assistant director and spend several years working his way up the ranks. That's how the system worked. To become a director, you served an apprenticeship period during which your official title was assistant director. It was paid on-the-job vocational training, which meant you weren't supposed to be doing any other schooling or training at the same time. But Noriaki was still enrolled in school, and he didn't want to give it up. He didn't think it made sense to put all his eggs in one basket. He'd already abandoned one career path. What if directing didn't suit him either? But Dai was put out by this. They told him he had to choose one or the other. And so, are you getting a sense of how his mind works yet? He continued to go to school in secret while working at Dai as an assistant director. This was 1955, and he was apprenticing mostly under director Koji Shima. And whenever there was a big test or something he needed to be in class for, he'd call in sick and make someone else sub for him on set. During his time as an assistant director, he had the chance to work with miniatures, specifically on films for director Umetsugo Inoue. His first real experience with special effects was a thing called Uchujen Tokyo ni Arawaru, which translates as Spacemen Appear in Tokyo, but which is better known by its English language release title, Warning from Space. It was directed in 1956 by Koji Shima and is about giant starfish aliens who come to Japan to warn of an impending catastrophe. It's notable for being the first Japanese science fiction film to be made in color. Yuasa was assistant director on it, and he appears briefly as an extra. He couldn't quite shake the acting, could he? Eventually, Yuasa had served long enough in the apprentice role, and the time had come to make the leap to being a director. And wouldn't you know it, it was to be a monster movie. The Japanese title was Dai Gunju Nezura. There is no proper English title because it never got made, and so it was never shown in English. But let's translate that title to Giant Horde Monster Nezura. Or maybe let's just call it the Great Rat Swarm. It was to be about an invasion of giant rats. Yuasa actually made a trailer for it while it was in pre-production, but there was a problem. The sets had become infested with fleas due to the boneheaded plan to use actual live rats, so it turned into this health and safety nightmare. The movie was canceled and left a lingering distaste to die eye towards monster movies. So instead, Yuasa made his directing debut in 1964 with a musical comedy called Shiawasanara Teiwo Tataku. And if you don't recognize that title in its Japanese form, let me translate it for you. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Yep, no foolin', that's where that song came from. And again, let me recognize the hardworking and insightful writers whose work I cited earlier, because I don't speak Japanese. 
I know one sentence in Japanese. Watash tachi no yakyu daisuke desu. It means my whole family loves baseball. Luckily, that happens to be true because I don't know how to reword it if I had to make any corrections. Everything else I'm saying about Japanese is partly Google Translate, partly the research done by others. Someday, I'll go to Japan, tell everyone I meet how much my family loves baseball, and then presumably I'll starve to death. Tom and Akio are having an easier time of it than I will. They've landed intact on an alien world. The gravity's fine. The air is breathable. So much for traveling 500,000 years, this appears to have taken less time than riding their bikes into the woods. The only trick is they seem to have landed in front of a giant photograph. I'm only kidding, but I want to draw attention to this crappy composite because I want to say a few words about it. In today's digital world, combining multiple images is a simple matter of throwing up a green screen and letting software do the heavy lifting. But back in the 1960s, this was a photochemical process involving complicated equipment, specialized film stocks, and multiple steps that had to be executed with exacting precision. And this laser bolt that just shot in is just another optical layer to contend with, layers upon layers. Dai didn't have an in-house optical printing unit, so there was no one in the company who could help Yuasa. So he took to haunting a film lab to watch the process and learn the technique, which means he mastered those particular aspects of optical printing that he had the chance to witness and relentlessly turned to the shallow well he did know. The optically printed laser blasts herald the arrival of Gaios, or Space Gaios, to be pedantic. The original plan was to create an additional new monster for Guiron to slice up, but for cost reasons, they just pulled the existing Gaios costume out of storage and painted it silver. One of the things Yuasa and his team learned over the course of making the Gamera films was that monster acting was a very special kind of acting. Over at Toho, they had monster suit actors like Harua Nakajima, a very athletic person, a trained stuntman with considerable physical stamina, and also the ability to act. And the original Godzilla suit was a walloping 220 pounds. Nakajima famously lost a lot of weight sweating under all that rubber. Yuasa didn't have anyone like him, and naively thought he could just put any old actor into a monster costume. In the 1965 Gamera, the poor things quickly exhausted themselves. So for the later films like this one, Yuasa got proper professional stunt actors to do the monsters. The second improvement was to make the suits lighter and more flexible. At first, the suits were made by Masao Yagi, president of X Productions, the company that made most of the monster suits for Toho and others. This has created some minor confusion because there's also a jazz musician named Masao Yagi who did some soundtracks, including the score for Legend of Dinosaurs and Monster Birds. Two different people, though. In 1966, Dai switched to having the suits made by Ryusaku Takayama. Yuasa thought Takayama's creations were better, lighter, more comfortable for the actors. But they were also fragile and easily broken. Those things go hand in hand. Art director Akira Inoue generally tried to make the monster costumes that looked good walking forward. Guiron presented a challenge because of the knife head. Initially, the plan was for the creature to stand on his hind legs, but because of the knife, the actor had trouble seeing well enough to walk properly, so they shifted to having Guiron crawl on all fours, which Yuasa had hoped to avoid. The name Guiron is meant to evoke the guillotine, but things do get a little wonky going from a French word to an attempt to evoke that word in Japanese to rendering that Japanese name in anglicized letters, which is why it is sometimes rendered as Gion with two L's. And Giron gets to show off all his knife-heady guillotine monster havoc in this scene as he dismembers his opponent with plenty of cartoony purple blood. Perhaps you will not be surprised when I tell you the U.S. distributor, American International Pictures, decided the sight of Guiron slicing up Gaios like a sausage was too much for the kids in the audience and sliced that material out of the American edition, shown under the less-than-illuminating title Attack of the Monsters. And frankly, is there anything here more extreme than you'd find in Looney Tunes or Tom and Jerry cartoons? 
This is not presented in a form that is intended to be accepted as literal, realistic facts. It is exaggerated and stylized. Yuasa has said that his decision to include bloody monster violence with blue and purple blood was out of a desire to make the monsters seem less like humans. In his view, the bloodshed made them seem more animalistic, less like people in suits. Yuasa told an anecdote that he was at a park when a little girl came up to him and said that she had a message from Aiji Tsuburaya, the special effects master at Toho. The girl said that Tsuburaya said that Yuasa shouldn't be showing all this bloody violence in the Gamera films. Which is interesting, in light of the fact that Tsuburaya was himself responsible for introducing more and more cartoonish silliness into Godzilla's antics. There was possibly a kinship between these two men. But Yuasa thought to himself, you know, I'm just talking to a kid. I'm not even sure that's a real message from Tsuburaya. So he never replied or did anything about it. In fact, Yuasa never met or spoke to Tsuburaya ever. Yuasa directed the effect sequences as well as the regular live action, but he relied heavily on his special effects cinematographer, Kazufumi Fuji. Everything that they did was meticulously storyboarded, and it took about a month to create those storyboards. The effect sequences themselves on a Gamera film typically took about two months to shoot, whereas the live action shoots were completed in about four weeks. Now, perhaps you've seen the 1965 film Godzilla vs. Monster Zero, also called Monster Zero, also called Invasion of Astro Monster. And for some reason, the official title these days is Invasion of Astro Monster, which is clunky and awful, and I hate it, whereas I saw it under the title Monster Zero, and that title is elegant and terrific. Well, whatever title you see it under, that film was also made under the edict of a U.S. distributor that wanted to ensure an American in the cast. And so, for that film, Toho cast Nick Adams alongside Japanese co-star Akira Takarada as a pair of astronauts who travel to the mysterious Planet X. They explore the craggy surface of that world and its futuristic buildings until they meet the inhabitants who tell them that the people of Planet X are terrorized by the monster Ghidorah, and they want to execute a trade with the humans of Earth, exchanging scientific wisdom for resources to fight Ghidorah. Things go off in a different direction from there, but in broad strokes, and visually as well, the opening part of Gamera vs. Guiron tracks very closely to that earlier Godzilla picture. Both films open with a white lab-coated scientist talking to reporters at a space observatory, for example. And some of the most powerful deja vu moments between those two movies are during these early scenes as Tom and Akio explore the city. And you know, I was remiss earlier. When I told the story about the casting of Christopher Murphy and didn't even mention the name of his co-star, it's Nobuhiro Kajima. As far as I know, Kajima's one and only screen role is this film. I'd be happy to be proved wrong, but that's all I've got for you now. Hey, do you like these glowing eyes? I do. It's a spiffy effect and really atmospheric. I like it so much, I'm not even going to complain that they pulled the exact same effect in the previous year's film, Gamera vs. Virus, which was also fairly obviously inspired by Monster Zero. I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Wow, So I hope you're paying attention to these little callbacks because there's something very deliberate going on in the storytelling, but I don't want to delve too much into it yet until we've had more of the bits of evidence show up. But the alien women are going to put on translators to be able to converse with our Japanese-speaking heroes. And just a few minutes ago, in screen time at least, 
the kids had openly speculated on whether that was going to be possible. Time and again, we're getting some unlikely scenario expressed only to then have it happen exactly as described. So, supposedly, Tom and Akio have landed on the 10th planet of the solar system, whose orbit has kept it hidden on the opposite side of the sun and thereby unobserved from Earth all this time. That is, a planet X. X as in 10, a 10th planet. I know they keep saying stars in the subtitles, but they mean planets. It's not a translation mistake. If you listen to the Japanese dialogue closely, you can hear Akio ask about Hoshi, the Japanese word for star, not Wakusei, the word for planet. The problem isn't in the subtitles, it's in the script. Oh, and by the way, if you're paying that much attention to the dialogue, you'll probably notice that you can see the actor's breath vaporize as they speak. The studio was that cold. Those poor kids. Anyway, the idea of a tenth planet crops up in science fiction films from time to time, including, I should note, in Warning from Space, the science fiction film about starfish aliens that was Yuasa's introduction to the genre. It's because for a while there was some real consideration that something along those lines might actually have happened. Not a phantom world populated by giant monsters and evil space women, obviously, but an additional planet in our solar system that we hadn't identified yet. The discovery of Neptune was a surprise revelation that we'd had this extra planet in our solar system all this time and not known about it. This begged the obvious question, well, is that all? And in the early 20th century, astronomers were wondering if maybe some irregularities in the orbits of the outermost planets might be a reaction to gravity influences from some further out planet. And in 1930, Pluto was discovered. It turned out to be too small to mean anything. It was ultimately dropped from being considered a planet at all. So if there is a planet X, it no longer makes sense for it to be a tenth planet because we don't even have nine anymore. So actually these days, this speculative idea is referred to as planet nine. This is the second time that Akio has voiced his opinion that the defining characteristic of a superior civilization is one with no wars or traffic accidents. It's such a strange idea, but the fact it comes up repeatedly in the film means the filmmakers want us to notice that line. Because it is so strange, and shows a child's view of the universe. He's invoking the types of unexpected, untimely deaths that he can think of, and that a superior society would work to prevent such things. But it's a child's interpretation of that idea, as is the bizarre idea that a computer malfunction was the cause of uncontrollable monsters, as if a giant knife-headed reptile is a sort of computer glitch. I mean, have you tried turning it off and on again? Now, over in Monster Zero, the American and Japanese astronauts who travel to Planet X are seduced by that so-called superior society's promises of a cure to all disease, a grown-up's idea of preventable deaths that a superior society would seek to prevent. They're reflections of each other. Akio's version is the child's eye view. And so here we learn that Flobella and Barbella are alleged to be the sole survivors of their people on a dying world besieged by giant killer monsters and in the process of being overrun by a glacier. I mean, talk about hard times. In the 1960s, Toho was mopping up profits around the world with multiple giant monster and science fantasy tent poles. Clearly, there was a market for Japanese monsters, and Dai was leaving money on the table by not even trying for it. In this context, the first Gamera film was conceived. Now, the story's been told many times and in slightly different variations, so it's almost certainly apocryphal. Basically, the myth goes that Dai executive Masaichi Nagata was inspired while looking out of an airplane window at something that looked like a giant turtle. Maybe it was an island, maybe it was a turtle-shaped cloud, maybe it was just some made-up anecdote to give the press something to write about, but he comes back to the office and tasks Nissan Takahashi with writing a script called Fire-Breathing Turtle Attacks Tokyo. 
Now, Nagata was a serious businessman. He was Dai Ai's studio chief, later a member of its board. He was the producer of Rashomon, possibly the most admired movie to come out of Japan. Certainly a culturally influential touchstone of enormous impact. Nagata wasn't that fond of Rashomon, though, not to his taste. But he was at a meeting in Hollywood with some unnamed jackamole who asked him, oh, are movies made in Japan too? So mostly to get back at that guy, Nagata entered Rashomon in international festivals, and of course the rest is history. Cue the Simpsons joke, Homer retorts, that's not how I remember it. Anyway, Nagata now has a script for his Godzilla knockoff, and his son Hidimasa Nagata wants to produce it. But who's going to make it for him? Dai was in an awkward position. Institutionally, after the failure of the giant rat extravaganza, the company had soured on monster movies. It wasn't a business they felt comfortable being in. And they didn't have a special effects department to speak of, and very little in the way of staff, with any decent experience of doing effects-oriented work. And it was a very conformist, don't-rock-the-boat culture. You don't get in trouble for doing what everyone else is doing. Anyone stupid enough to try to make this giant fire-breathing turtle movie is going to be starting from scratch without resources doing something we've never done before. There's going to be a ton of trial and error, and all those errors are opportunities for failure and blame. Making this movie is career suicide. But there happens to be a brand new director at Dai known for making irrational, iconoclastic decisions. A guy who defied orders to drop out of school while apprenticing. A guy who's worked on science fiction films involving miniatures and special effects. He's also the guy behind that misfired rat invasion debacle, who barely clawed his way out by making a musical that then ended up being a commercial disaster. In other words, a guy who bucks conventional wisdom has got nothing left to lose, he might actually be able to do it, and he's just crazy enough to try. And in fact, Noriaki Yuasa embraced the job with relish. He started making elaborate storyboards mapping out what he had in mind. His supervisor, Umeji Inoue, marveled at the storyboards. You must be stupid to be taking this so seriously. Yuasa's sincere effort and attention paid off, though. And where others saw only career suicide, Yuasa helped create an enduring franchise that was critical to helping keep the struggling studio afloat during hard times. Dai Ai was faltering and ultimately declared bankruptcy in 1971. We'll cycle back to talking about Dai Ai's bankruptcy a little later, but for now we can observe that the Gamera sequels of the late 1960s were an exercise in dwindling returns and diminished expectations. In fact, let's put some meat on those bones and get into the details. After the success of the first Gamera picture in 1965, Dai Ai felt bullish enough to increase the budget and make Gamera vs. Baragon as a bigger, more lavish spectacle. Baragon was made for around 80 million yen, roughly twice as much as the first film. But for that cost, Baragon didn't show as much of a profit, and so Dai tightened the purse strings going forward. Gamera vs. Guiron was made for around 24 million yen, almost half what the first film cost, and the lowest budget of the original series, not counting Gamera Super Monster in 1980, which was a special case. So to get a grip on what this really means, 24 million yen in 1969 has the purchasing power, more or less, of around 85 million yen in 2020. Converting that to dollars, we're talking about the 1969 equivalent of what today would be less than $800,000. I'm playing a little fast and loose with the conversions here, but this is just to give you a context for understanding what Yuasa had to work with to make a movie with three giant monsters, spaceships, an alien planet, teleportation effects, flying meteors, and three child actors. One consequence of those tight budgets was the use of recycled footage where possible. So we get this recap of past highlights to provide some visually stimulating excitement for a few minutes without needing any new material. The same trick was being used in other Gamera movies and Godzilla movies around the same time and for the same reasons. You might notice, being the eagle-eyed Gamera aficionado that you are, that this clip show sequence doesn't include any material from Baragon, the highest budgeted Gamera film of them all, and the one most fans today single out as their favorite. Why is that, you wonder? 
Well, that's a good question because it points us back to the central theme of our conversation. It has to do with children. Back in the very first film, screenwriter Nissan Takahashi had begun to develop the idea that Gamera was a friend of children. But that idea was absent from Baragon. When Baragon opened, Yuasa went around to various theaters to gauge audience reactions and perform his own sort of covert market research. And he noted that the audiences were full of children. But during the human storyline scenes, those kids got bored and left their seats to go get candy and snacks. Now, you could take that feedback and conclude that the most important thing was to get more monster action into the film and space it out better so there weren't so many long stretches of dialogue. That's one conclusion you could draw. Yuasa, however, decided that the answer was to change the dialogue scenes to be about kids so that they connected to the audience better. And given the tight budgets and how hard it would have been to shoot more monster scenes, Yuasa's answer was certainly more doable. And let's also acknowledge this. Baragon is the only film in the series in which Yuasa didn't direct both the human scenes and the monster scenes. He was relegated to just the special effects on that one, while Shigeo Tanaka got the official director credit. Yuasa liked the idea of Gamera as a friend to children. He wanted the films to be more childlike. And he'd originated the cycle by directing that first film and handling its special effects. By staking out the idea that Baragon faltered by being too adult, he was implicitly making the case that the success of the Gamera franchise rested with him and his aesthetic choices. And you gotta give it to Yuasa, whatever adult American fans now say about its qualities, Baragon did the poorest box office of the series and was easily bested, even by this, arguably the most childish and cheap-looking of the lot. Interviewed by J.D. Lees at 2003's G-Fest X, Yuasa put it this way, quote, Our real goal was to create a character that was the protector of children and a fantasy for children to watch, and for them to know that there's someone on their side. So I have some more cast notes for you. Tom's mother, Elza, is played by an actress named Edith Hansen. And if you're a fan of Japanese monsters of a certain age, you may have grown up watching a fabulously insane TV show called Space Giants, which was the English dubbed version of a show that aired in Japan as Ambassador Magma. It was about a family of transformer style robots that could convert into rocket ships, Goldar, Silvar, and Gam. They help protect the Earth from the clutches of space invader Rodak and his various menaces, such as giant monsters, the Lugo men zombies, and so on. And there was a plucky Lois Lane-style photographer named Liz. That was Edith Hansen. Now, the mother of Akio and Tomoko is played by Yuko Hamada. She was a busy actress in the 1960s especially, but there's one title on her resume I want to single out. 1968's The Snake Girl and the Silver-Haired Witch. The thing that makes that movie noteworthy is that it's in some ways a cousin of this film. After Gamera vs. Virus was finished, the bosses at Dai asked Yuasa if he would make two Gamera films back-to-back. Yuasa had expected Virus to be the end of the series, and the idea of making two complex and demanding Gamera pictures the same year was absurd. So he talked them out of that insanity and into making The Snake Girl and The Silver-Haired Witch. It was released on a double bill with another wonderfully nutty film called Yokai Daisenso, also known as A Hundred Monsters, and then he made Guiron, and followed that with a pair of war movies in 1969. Sorry, I got sidetracked. We were talking about Yuko Hamada. Anyway, she's in The Snake Girl and The Silver-Haired Witch. That's been described as a children's psychological horror film that no one in their right mind would show to a child. We've talked about Ken Omura already, so that just leaves Tomoko, played by Miyuki Akiyama. 
So I do have an anecdote about Miyuki Akiyama. I'm not 100% sure it's correct, though. Normally, I don't like to mention a book or a movie that I haven't actually seen. I came up with that rule for myself a long time ago when I found that misinformation had a tendency to get amplified and turned into received wisdom because it got shared by a lot of people who never bothered to check, and I wanted to avoid being a link in such a chain. I don't get it right all the time. Sometimes I can't help but pass along information I haven't been able to separately verify. Sometimes I myself am the cause of the error because I misunderstood something. But generally speaking, it's a rule I try to live by. And in this case, I haven't been able to obtain anything that would serve to verify this one way or the other. So take it with a grain of salt. But... It's my understanding that in the early 1970s, the Children's Television Workshop started exporting licensed local variations on Sesame Street to different overseas markets, and there was a Japanese version called Open Sesame. Miyuki Akiyama was either a cast member or a guest on the show, and I think she was reunited with Ken Omura at some point on it. The Sesame Street connection seems apropos of where we are in the story right now, as the adults continue to dispute Tomoko's thoroughly factual account of the situation. I'm thinking of Mr. Snuffleupagus. You also described this theme, which appears throughout the Gamera films, as Gamera is visible to children but not visible to adults. Not that the adults can't see Gamera literally, but that they try to deny the existence of Gamera. Gamera is something that can't be explained with science, and as such, innocent children can see Gamera, while scientists and adults remain in the dark. In other words, a giant turtle version of Santa Claus. Yuasa says the origin of the idea comes from his own childhood. Quote, Sometimes I would get into mischief, and old people from the neighborhood would tell me, Japan lost the war because we had people like you. Not being one to take this lying down, I would respond, Hmm, so we would have won the war if we had more people like you? I always felt those adults from my childhood were rather like the adults in the Gamera films. Children view the world as a place with wonderful feelings and great possibilities. It is important that adults try to share this view. All right, so with that framework in mind, what have we seen so far? At the start of the film, Dr. Shiga and the scientists at the observatory say they aren't sure where the mysterious waves are coming from, but it could be from somewhere as far away as 500,000 years journey. Later that same afternoon, two children with a consumer-grade telescope identify the source of the waves and see an incoming spaceship. The next morning, they set out into the woods to find the spaceship, and on their first outing, they find it right away. They briefly give some thought as to whether it will be difficult to communicate with the aliens, but it turns out the aliens can translate Japanese, so that's fine. They enter the ship easily, and whatever uninformed random manhandling they give the controls either pilots it back to its home, or at least doesn't interfere with the journey, which happens to take a few hours. There are some meteors that threaten them, but Gamera shows up and takes care of that. On the alien world, they find a breathable atmosphere, Earth-like gravity, and they are able to navigate their way through the city and its futuristic technology on their own. So... Even before we get to anything about the battles between giant monsters, we've got a plot which, on paper, is a string of ludicrous coincidences that absolutely stagger the mind. Set aside suspension of disbelief, this movie takes disbelief out back and strangles it to death. If you were an art designer handed this script and told to visualize it, at what point would you say to yourself, I think the most important thing here is strict realism? Give me a break. This is the logic of a child's fantasy, specifically a child's wish fulfillment fantasy. None of the wooden, lifeless adults believe them at first, but every word of these kids' outlandish tales turns out to be true. At every point, they are vindicated and shown to be superior. Yuasa himself put it, the film was like a children's storybook. I want to linger on that quote a moment. What do we mean when we talk about children's storybooks? Well, a slightly more familiar phraseology might be fairy tales. And like classic children's fairy tales, what we have here is a story about precocious children who disobey their parents, go off into the woods, are kidnapped by witches who want to eat them, but they manage to escape through a combination of luck, pluck, and the intervention of a hero. 
You can jumble up the pieces of Hansel and Gretel, Little Red Riding Hood, Goldilocks, keep tossing examples as you see fit, and you've got the contours of Gamera versus Gueron. For example, the matter of shaving Accio's head. Along with the scene of Gueron cutting Gaios into bite-sized snacks, this scene is one of the most remembered parts of the movie, and often singled out for bewildered commentary on how this movie juxtaposes seemingly childish content with seemingly over-the-top darkness. But seriously, though, is this any darker than what you would find in a typical fairy tale? In the original Red Riding Hood story, the wolf eats Red and her grandmother, and then the huntsman comes along to cut open the wolf's belly and pull the two of them out alive. Or perhaps more on point, in Hansel and Gretel, the two kids are abandoned in the woods by their stepmother who can't afford to feed them anymore. They're captured by a witch who plans to eat them, but escape by shoving the witch into her own oven where she burns to death, and they steal all her money and belongings. Frankly, as kid stories go, Gamera vs. Gueron is pretty tame. One more thought on Akio's shaved head. Remember how Kon Omura, the slapstick policeman, said that if they continued to be naughty, he'd shave their heads? That's another feature of fairy tales, the absurdly literal morality plays, where you warn a child, don't do X or Y will happen, and then the child does X and immediately Y happens. And there's also the notion of characters who have fantastic adventures in magical realms that maybe were just dreams, but the hero has some trinket they end up carrying with them back to their home that serves to prove it was all real. And to me, that's where so many of the commentators on this film get it wrong. They walk into the theater wanting to jazz on some raucous monster action like the often fairly serious Godzilla films made by an older generation of artists still haunted by the traumas of war, and instead they see this bright and colorful thing from a younger group of artists with an entirely different mindset, and the commentators get grumbly because there's all this distracting and juvenile stuff about children and space women who want to eat their brains that's getting in the way of the monster fights. And then the monster fights look silly. But you don't have that problem if you try to meet the movie where it's coming from. And instead of trying to separate the child story and the monster story into different parts, you treat this as a fairy tale starring Gamera. Are you ready to settle in for the first round of Gamera vs. Gueron action? Well, remember I mentioned before how Dai did not have an in-house optical effects department and had to send out to an outside vendor every time they needed an optical composite. As a general rule, Dai tried to steer away from optical effects in favor of practical effects they could do in the studio. Whereas Godzilla blasted an atomic ray from his mouth and created the expectation that Japanese monsters would shoot some kind of fiery death out of their mouth, Yuasa and his team decided that their fire-breathing monster turtle would be a real, honest-to-gosh, fire-breathing monster turtle with real fire. So yes, that's a gas-powered flamethrower you're looking at. Insanely dangerous, but cheaper than optically printed rays. Actually having a gas-powered flamethrower in the real monster suit right up by the actor's head was a health and safety no-no, so they built a special Gamera head with a flame effect and nobody inside it, but it was unpredictable and they never knew for sure exactly how far the flame would shoot. It made the scenes very exciting, joked Yuasa later. Like all the monster footage, it was shot at four times the speed, so when it was played back at regular speed, things would move slower with a greater sense of gravity and mass. This meant, however, that on set, the effects tended to look completely ridiculous. The child actors were watching and made fun of Yuasa for how silly the monster scenes looked on set. At which point, the snarkier members of the audience listening to me here may have just said something unkind about how the monster scenes look even when slowed down. So yeah, let's, let's address that. You're correct, there's nothing on screen at the moment that looks remotely authentic or believable. But so what? You ever seen a Mickey Mouse cartoon? That guy doesn't look anything like an actual mouse, and anyway, mice don't wear shirts or talk. Kermit the Frog has never once looked like anything other than a felt puppet. 
doesn't seem to have stopped people from enjoying the Muppets. And to put a finer point on it, in the 1979 Muppet movie, it was a big deal to see Kermit sitting on a log, playing the banjo or riding a bicycle. Those were groundbreaking effects and made audiences thrill to see them without at any point ever persuading anyone that they were seeing a real frog. Everyone knew it was a puppet. The thrill was in seeing the puppet do something special. Not to say that Yuasa's team are pushing the envelope with groundbreaking effects here, but just to note that the point was to create entertaining and stimulating visuals that were pleasing to watch and which served to create these monsters as characters that the audience could cheer on or boo without expecting that a strict standard of visual realism was necessary. I said when the movie started that you're likely to have a better, more authentic experience if you are yourself a child or have some children with you while you watch. And this is likely to be a problem if you're trying to watch this movie in Japanese with subtitles. I hadn't given that issue much thought back when I first started writing about these movies in a scholarly way. I was in my 20s back then. My circle of friends and colleagues were the same age. And I approached my fandom from a very selfish perspective. What does this mean to me? What do I like or dislike? And like many snobbish film geeks, I had it in my head that subtitles were inherently, inevitably, immutably better than dubbing in all cases, end of sentence. Subtitles allow you to preserve the original actor's performance, allow multilingual viewers to appreciate the original dialogue, maybe even help you learn a new language. Dubbing never matches the lips, it substitutes someone else's performance, possibly with racist caricatures or accents, creates an opportunity for ridicule or condescension. All of which is true, but if you're reading the subtitles, you're not looking at the screen. And you need to be a proficient reader, which excludes a lot of young children. It distorts the audience makeup. Some people don't want to read subtitles, whether they're proficient readers or not. And that means there are theaters that won't show subtitled movies. Subtitled movies get exiled to art houses, to a specialized audience of urban dwelling adults. Which isn't really the audience for this, is it? So if you've opted to listen to the English dubbing, I'm right there with you. The original English dubbing, recorded in 1969, was commissioned by American International Pictures for the U.S. release of Attack of the Monsters. This was prepared by a dubbing studio called Titra, and the thing about Titra is that they were very sincere about doing a good job. You can complain if you want that the dubbed voices don't match the lips perfectly, but it's a bit like complaining that it's wet when it rains. Your lips move when you speak as part of the process of generating the sounds of the words you speak. If you change the words, the lip movement should change with them, especially if you change them as radically as you would need to in order to replace Japanese language sounds with English language sounds. So anyone seriously interested in doing a good job with dubbing would take the translated script and then work on rewriting it to try to find the best wording that comes as close as possible to the lip movements on screen. This means a certain tension between trying to be faithful to the script versus trying to make the dubbing less ostentatious. In the case of Gamera movies, we have a really good illustration of the difference between competent dubbing by dedicated professionals and the path of least resistance approach from the cheapest fly-by-night operation you can find. Because there came a time when a new U.S. distributor took over the Gamera films from AIP, Sandy Frank Productions, to issue the Gamera movies on VHS home video with a different dubbing track. If you've ever encountered Gamera vs. Guiron on a bargain bin VHS tape or saw the Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode, you've encountered that dub track. The voice actors read from a script so poorly translated as to border on the incomprehensible, and calling them voice actors is itself maybe too generous. So why trash the perfectly serviceable AIP track by Titra for something so awful? Good question. The wrong answer, if you want to hear it first, would be to note that Sandy J. Frank was a comedy writer. 
He started with the Harvard Lampoon, wrote for Saturday Night Live, Late Night with David Letterman, In Living Color. He won Emmys for his comedy writing. You might say, oh, this comedian slapped together a terrible dub track to make these films into objects of absurdity. The fact they landed on Mystery Science Theater was the inevitable trajectory. But nope, that's not it. Sandy Frank had nothing to do with creating those dub tracks. That's how he got the films. The dubbing came from Dai. The good dub by AIP was made by Americans. The crappy dub for the Sandy Frank version was the one the Japanese filmmakers had made. In the 1960s, it frequently happened that foreign filmmakers would go ahead and commission an English-language dub track on their own as part of the original production. This meant that when you went courting international distributors, you could offer them an already turnkey-ready English-language soundtrack. Anyone who wanted to redo that, like AIP, could, of course, invest their own money to redo the dub, but you didn't have to. Also, if you were a non-English-speaking territory, it would be much easier to find a vendor who could redub from English into whatever, Italian, French, Spanish, than it would be to find someone who could dub from Japanese into Italian, French, or Spanish. It just opened up more opportunities. Many Japanese films, including a lot of the Godzilla movies, bought international dub tracks from vendors in Hong Kong. When Dai Ai went to dub the Gamera pictures into English, they used a company called Pedro Productions, which appears to have been run by Pedro Komeyama, who also acted in a few films for Nikatsu and was leveraging his English language skills wherever he could. Judging by the results, one could doubt whether his English language skills amounted to much. I said that treating this as a fairy tale resolves some of the wonky storytelling decisions because they fall in line with fairy tale storytelling conventions. But that doesn't explain why fairy tales have such wonky storytelling conventions in the first place. And it has to do with the historical conditions hundreds of years ago when those stories were written. With a high rate of childhood death, plentiful dangers, and limited circumstances for careful hands-on parenting. So fairy tales occupied a useful social function of scaring kids straight, telling exaggerated and very memorable stories about terrible things that happen when you disobey your parents and good things that happen when you follow simple morals. And there's a reason these kind of stories might have had appeal to Japanese audiences in the 1960s. It was a time of wrenching social change as families moved out of rural areas where there were extended families to help with childcare, and into cities where increasingly mothers joined the workforce. This left a post-war generation of kids unattended, and in the 1960s the term kagiko was coined, literally latchkey kid, to describe these unattended children responsible for self-parenting. And 1969 saw this filter into at least two of the major monster franchises. We've got this film, Gamera vs. Guiron, and we've got Godzilla's Revenge, in which a latchkey kid hallucinates himself onto Monster Island to learn lessons from Godzilla about standing up to bullies. One was released in the United States as Attack of the Monsters, the other as All Monsters Attack. We shouldn't pretend these are coincidences. Now, when Noriaka Yuasa first started making Gamera movies, when he first got the job in 1965, he had to start from scratch. There was no one at Dai to show him the ropes. And to make matters worse, here he was making a knockoff of Godzilla, but he hadn't actually seen any Godzilla movies before. So in one of the most gloriously telling Yuasa moments of them all, this naive and wonderfully open and trusting soul called up Toho and asked them if he could please borrow some prints to watch them. Uh, No, dude, they told him he could go buy his ticket at the theater like everyone else. Eventually, he connected with some of Toho's ex-special effects people who'd struck out on their own to start their own company making effects for TV, and they had some prints that they were willing to loan him. But just imagine. Hey, producers of Godzilla movies, I just got hired to be your competition, but I don't really know what I'm doing. Can you help me? But here's the thing. Yuasa didn't see it that way at all. He genuinely didn't think he was competing with Toho. He saw them as like his older brother. And here he was, looking up to his older brother, asking for a bit of a brotherly assist. 
But the whole big brother, little brother relationship has some wrinkles. There's another aspect to that relationship, another story Yuasa told many times in interviews. He's told the story in slightly varying levels of detail over time, but there's one detail he invariably brings up. It has to do with his legitimate professional jealousy that he had to create a special effects unit to die eye out of bailing wire and duct tape while Toho had a sprawling special effects unit with such a deep bench they could afford to lose a few folks to go start a new company and not even feel the pain. Every time Yuasa found himself talking in public about the head start Toho had over him and the experience they had well before Godzilla even came along, he always found a way to mention war crimes. So Yuasa would talk glowingly about how much he admired the artistry behind 1942's The War at Sea from Hawaii to Malaya. This was basically a propaganda film in which Toho's miniatures stood in to represent the attack on Pearl Harbor. Here are some of Yuasa's remarks about that film. A shining golden tower in the Japanese special effects movie history. No one has since made a film on that scale. And Toho burned all the miniatures to destroy any evidence and avoid being tried as war criminals. You know, and he's right. The Allied forces did seize the thing, believing it to be genuine newsreel footage. And clips from it were shown in the U.S. by Movie Tone News as actual documentary film clips, when in fact they were models. And so in that one story, Yuasa is linking Toho's technical superiority with that superiority being illegitimate and evil, and therefore his own scrappy efforts, underfunded and second-rate they may be, have a moral superiority. And we should note that those special effects artists behind wartime propaganda, so convincing that the generals mistook it for real, then turned around and made the 1954 Godzilla like a monster movie documentary. The original Godzilla is a movie that absolutely wants the audience to accept that what they are watching is genuine, that it really happened. That movie rises or falls based on how well you buy into the reality of what it's selling. But just because that movie functions that way doesn't mean every movie needs to be going after the same goal. Even the Toho Godzilla movies quickly moved away from that sense of realism and into more cartoony imagery. The Gamera films were self-consciously aimed at even younger audiences, and they came along within the contours of a well-defined Japanese monster movie genre. In the mid-1990s, I had the opportunity to meet and speak to some of the screenwriters of the 1990s era of Godzilla movies, and at the time, I was working on the first edition of my book on the history of Godzilla movies. I asked them, why is it that Japanese monster movies just jump in feet first with the embrace of the idea that giant monsters exist, whereas American movies spend time building up a narrative explanation for where the monsters come from? I naively assumed that I was going to get a reply about some fundamental difference between Japanese and American culture, something about how Japanese people have a belief in a spirit world and so monsters are a natural extension of this basic cultural identity, blah, 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 whatever. That was all in my head, but not the answer I got. Instead, the answer I got to my question was a brilliant insight into how this all works, a genius level explanation. Basically, he said, it's a monster movie. Of course it has monsters in it. I mean, wow. Obviously. No one wastes time trying to explain why people break into song in a musical. It'd be a pretty strange musical if no one started singing. Similarly, you're not going to have a very compelling monster movie if there are no monsters in it. Japanese monster movies have a distinctive flavor, distinguishable from other movies from other countries. So we designate these things with the Japanese word kaiju for weird beast. Kaiju movies are a special subset of monster movies, and audiences come to them knowing what to expect in much the same way as audiences go to musicals expecting some show tunes. You don't get dinged for showing guys in rubber monster suits on a miniature stage. That's what we've all come to see. Wow, I'm, I'm sorry. That stunned me into silence. Hang on, I'm recovering. Okay. So, 
You may be aware that there are some Gamera movies that absolutely do play the same playbook as the 1954 Godzilla and are all about convincing you that everything is real and factual. They are among the finest kaiju movies you can find. And if you don't know about them, you really should. So I should bring them up here at least to help explain and clarify what's what. To do so, I need to back up a bit. So. I haven't told you much about screenwriter Nissan Takahashi. He was the screenwriter behind every one of the Gamera movies made between 1965 and 1980, but that's just a drop in the bucket. He'd gotten his start at Dai Ai after winning a screenwriting contest in 1950 and ended up a prolific writer for the studio. He was a little bit older than Yuasa. He was born in 1926. We discussed earlier the dwindling budgets and tightening purse strings. Those were hints of the underlying financial distress that the studio was experiencing. In 1971, the company declared bankruptcy. At the time, Takahashi and Yuasa were developing an idea for something called Gamera vs. Gara Sharp. It was going to feature a giant serpent-like monster, and when Gamera kills it, the carcass splits open and two baby serpents emerge. There were some storyboards drawn up, but with Dai bankrupt, the idea fizzled. Now, just to be clear, bankruptcy isn't running out of money. Anyone can run out of money. Bankruptcy is way worse. Bankruptcy means your existing debts, that is, money you absolutely owe and absolutely have to pay, outweigh the value of everything you own and all the money you can conceivably expect to make if everything stays the way it is. It's an existential collapse. You can run out of money and keep what you already own, not if you're bankrupt. Everything you have will get taken and used to resolve some of your debts. So in 1971, Dai owed a lot of money to Nissan Takahashi for having written a lot of their movies. Apparently, they owed him more money than they did any other single individual. They had an argument about it. So Masaichi Nagata, the big boss, supposedly takes Takahashi aside and says, how's about we just give you the rights to Gamera and call it even? Takahashi agreed, they signed some papers, and that was that. Allegedly, Nissan Takahashi emerged in the early 1970s as the owner of Gamera, but he didn't have much of an ability to do anything about it. The genre was winding down, international distribution deals were hard to come by, he didn't have a studio or anything, no way to get funding to launch the series back. Now, meanwhile, Dai Ai reorganized, merged with Katakawa, and came back to life. A resurgent interest in Godzilla in the late 1980s and early 1990s inspired the revived Dai Ai to chase the same market, and so filmmakers Shisuke Kaneko and Shinji Higuchi made three Gamera films between 1995 and 1999 aimed at a more grown-up audience and which won international acclaim. So whatever happened to Takahashi? Wasn't he supposed to own Gamera? Well, that's kind of what he was thinking. A little, hey, wait a minute. Takahashi did publish a Gamera novel called Gamera vs. Phoenix in 1995, adapting a plot that had been considered as a possible storyline for the rebooted series. But one can imagine the guy feeling a little hard done by. And Yuasa wasn't very happy with the 1990s Gamera films since he preferred them to be children's movies. So what was the deal with Masaichi Nagata? He was a complex, difficult man, as many movie moguls were. He started his movie career at Nikatsu, but didn't get along with studio management and took a bunch of their personnel to start his own company, Daiichi Aiga. It was a doomed enterprise focused more on artistic perfectionism than economics, and it went bankrupt pretty quickly, but not before gifting the world with several masterpieces. Nagata then took over another studio, Shinko Kinema, but the Japanese government started reorganizing the movie business during the war years to optimize propaganda and to shore up an important industry. This reorganization process ended up creating Dai Ai by fusing together several smaller outfits. By 1947, Nagata was president of Dai Ai, and he held that role until the company folded in 1971, aside from a brief period in the post-war occupation when the Americans ousted him, but that didn't last. Yuasa said that Nagata was disinterested in science fiction and left them alone to do their work, but that his son, Hidimasa, tried to be more hands-on, offering various ideas that Yuasa thought weren't very good. 
think on that. What must the rejected ideas have been like? Since we've only really talked about Nagata in the context of Gamera and bankruptcy, I don't want to leave you with an unfair opinion of the man. Here's a short list of some of the movies Masaichi Nagata produced to give you a better taste of his legacy. Rashomon, Gate of Hell, Ugetsu, Sancho the Bailiff, Zatoichi the Outlaw, The Sleepy Eyes of Death, and the 1958 version of 47 Ronin. And if you'll recall, I said the only thing I can say in Japanese is Watash Tachi no Yaku Daisuke Des, my whole family loves baseball. So I also want to note that Masaichi Nagata was the owner of the professional baseball team, the Daigo Orions, and he was the first president of the Pacific League in 1953. He's in the Baseball Hall of Fame for that. He died in 1985 at the age of 79, arguably the most important Japanese movie producer of all. Not sure I agree with that statement, but as I said, it's arguable. Now, I have another Yuasa quote for you. I don't know quite where to put this one because I can't make heads or tails out of it, but now that you've got a better sense of his sensibility, you can just savor it for the Yogi Berra-like puzzle that it is. Here it goes. Quote, Many people in their 30s were very strongly influenced by the Gamera series, but I really don't know what kind of influence it had on them. That's from the 1996 David Milner interview. He just tossed that out without any context, like a conversational hand grenade. It wasn't in response to any question, and it wasn't followed up by anything. It just, I just get lost in that quote. It's a rabbit hole. And now they're going to sing the Gamera theme song again. So once again, it's time for a short dance party. I'll be back in just a minute when the song is over. Over the course of this film, I've offered up a variety of explanations for its odd characteristics. I've compared it to cartoons, the Muppets, and fairy tales, and I do think the fairy tale connection is instructive. Nearly all the puzzling storytelling choices snap into clarity the moment you stop trying to see this as a serious sci-fi thriller aimed at adults and recognize it as a kid's fairy tale mapping the Brothers Grimm onto giant monsters. I've also offered up various excuses for its chintzy and cheesy appearance. It was made for pocket change by a dying, almost bankrupt studio, and its makers had limited support and experience in what they were trying to do. All these things are true, but I hate how defensive they sound. I'd like to wind things up with a more affirmative statement, not a defense, but an offense. So here goes. The Internet Movie Database lists 29 movies that Noriaki Yuasa directed, and I suspect that list is woefully incomplete. There were close to 500 films made in Japan in 1969. There are over 3,500 films made around the world in 1969, and that's just one year. Think of all the movies made worldwide every year, year after year, from the dawn of cinema in 1895 to the present. If you had no interest in this, if you didn't like it, by far and away the easiest thing to do would be to not watch it. Not seeing a movie is the default. The vast majority of people have not seen the vast majority of movies. It is super easy to not see a movie. It takes no special effort or training. It's free. By contrast, seeing a movie does take some effort and does involve some cost. I mean, think of all those other Japanese films from 1969 or the other films by Noriaki Yuasa. Nearly all of them came and went with no more lasting consequence than a pleasant summer breeze. 
If you wanted to see them, you might find it impossible to track them down now. Go ahead, pop on over to Wikipedia and look up Japanese films from 1969. Most of them don't even have English titles. Of those that do, try tracking down a copy of Computer Free For All, or It's Tough Being a Man, or any of the 13 entries in the Woman Gambler series that got made that year. But then there's Gamera vs. Guiron. This thing has been shown around the world, repeatedly, for five decades and counting. It has found an audience in theaters, on television, on VHS, on Laserdisc, on DVD, on Blu-ray, on streaming. It has been shown dubbed in at least two different forms, or subtitled, or just plain Japanese. It has been lampooned by comedy robot shadow puppets. It has inspired subsequent generations of fans and filmmakers to pay homage to it. And all that stuff I said about how if you're not a six-year-old Japanese kid in the late 1960s, this isn't made for you? Well, I'm betting good money there's not a single six-year-old Japanese kid in the late 1960s listening to me now. Which means this movie has managed to connect against all odds to a far wider audience. So say what you will about the crinkly rubber suits and the visible wires, here we are, after all this time, still looking at them. No one put a gun to our head. We're here by choice. This movie, for all its weirdness, in fact, actually because of its weirdness, has spoken louder and longer and farther than almost any of its peers. Noriaki Yuasa gave a brief talk at the Sayama City Museum in 2003 when he said what I think might be the wisest thing ever said about cinema, and certainly a sentiment that I live my own life by. He said, please watch many movies, look for the good points in the movies, and praise the good you find. <laughs> Oh, man. There I was thinking I had this killer conclusion, all inspirational, like win one for the Gipper. And Akio had to bring up that crazy no wars and traffic accidents thing again and upstage me. Ah, oh, well, you know where I'm coming from. Go Gamera! This has been David Callett. Thank you for listening. Thank you.